Are there types of cases that seem to be more amenable to mediation than others? Are you seeing some trends in this type seems to reach settlement outside of court better? You know, I don't think so. Um, we've looked at that issue not from the standpoint of our kind of standard mediation model, but from the standpoint of early neutral evaluation, which is something I want to talk about a little bit. Um, and I think at least the, the uh, little bit of literature I've read on ENE uh, is that uh, that is ideally suited for employment cases. Uh, a lot of those have already been through the EEOC or some other kind of administrative process, so the parties know who each other is and what the issues are. Um, and those cases tend not to differ tremendously in terms of the track that they go through in federal court. Everybody knows what's going to happen. You take these depositions, you get this information, everybody files for summary judgment. So you can kind of look out forward and say, this is what's going to happen. So at the beginning of the case, there aren't a lot of mysteries. Um, and, and a lot of times you can deal with those cases very early on. Um, and, and I would say that probably when we send cases to mediation fairly early in the process, and again, that's, that's party driven, that's not court driven at this point, um, I would say people in those kinds of cases tend to ask for earlier settlement week settings than other kinds of cases. But once you get cases kind of through discovery and maybe pending summary judgment, um, I don't see that there's a huge difference in terms of subject matter, in terms of, of uh, which cases settle and which don't. Now, there are some kinds of cases we don't send through settlement week. Um, we, I don't think we ever have sent a pro se prisoner civil rights case through the settlement week process. Um, and we typically don't send, um, well, we don't send administrative matters like uh, Social Security cases or that sort of thing. They, they're just sort of automatically exempt from the process. And, and that's because those cases either typically don't settle, or if they do settle, they settle in a way that doesn't involve a formal mediation. Thank you. With respect to the question here, you, you tweaked the rule five or ten years ago to provide that if the parties wanted to, if you were unable to complete the mediation in the allotted time, if the parties wanted to continue with the mediator, they could work out an arrangement to compensate the mediator. Uh, that's only happened to me twice, but in some of the more complex cases, that's where you're at. You're actually making progress. And you spent three hours, and you really everybody feels like we could get this done. But uh, I think that was a that was an excellent uh, change in the rule. Yeah, and and uh, we do try to make at least to the litigants it very clear that what they get for free is basically two hours of the mediator's time, and anything beyond that, if the mediator wants to donate more time, that's up to the mediator. If the mediator says I can't donate any more, donate any more time, but I want to talk to you about compensation. Um, we don't have any problem with that going forward, and I understand that does happen rarely, but it does happen. Yeah. Brian, you had a question? Yeah, I, I have two related questions. One, do you keep track of mediator success rate on an individual basis? Related to that, do you do you do you make any effort to uh, assign certain cases to certain mediators, or is it entirely random? Okay. Uh, well, first question, uh, I've never done that, but you've now I always try to match up uh, cases and mediators. We do have some mediators who have requested that, but the, they only get, for example, employment cases, or they prefer complex cases or something of that nature. We try to honor those requests as best we can, um, but absent sort of a special request from either the mediator or the parties, and sometimes we do get parties who say, I'd like to have somebody with, with a background in this area. Um, if we don't get that, uh, the assignment is, is random. It's actually not even done by a judicial officer. I mean, it's done by our courtroom deputies. Um, I will say that after my courtroom deputy does the random assignment, before that goes out, she comes to me and gives me the list of all the cases and all the mediators, and I look through, and if I see things that I think are a mismatch in some way, I'll, I'll, I'll tweak it. Um, and and uh, it, it's usually not so much to try to get rid of a mediator that I think won't do a good job in that case, as it is to try to match up a case that has some specific difficulty with somebody that I know is going to be able to handle that. Um, for example, uh, if, if I get a case where, where it's, it's not a prisoner but it is a pro se litigant, um, sometimes I'll just think about personalities of mediators and think, who'd be more likely to be sort of that patient and that tolerant with somebody who doesn't understand the legal system and maybe do a slightly better job than, than somebody else. So sometimes I'll make those kinds of adjustments. 
Other questions about settlement? We okay. Uh, well, let me move on then to uh, something that we've, we've uh, put in writing, I think February of this year, but it's sort of the codification of, of Southern District practice. Uh, we do have a new procedures manual, which is on our website. Anybody who's interested in that, uh, it's www.ohsd for ohiosoutherndistrict.gov. Um, and actually, there'll be a link right there that will take you to, I think it's called mediation. Um, and then it'll get you our new procedures manual. And our new procedures manual uh, says that there are basically four different processes that we offer litigants in the Southern District of Ohio. And this is common now to all three seats of court. Uh, one is Settlement Week, and it describes it, uh, but as I said, it's pretty much as a practical matter restricted to Columbus because we're the only one who's doing that right now. Um, the second is um, attorney mediation. And uh, really in Columbus, Settlement Week is, that's, that's our version of attorney <coughs> mediation. It's my understanding in Dayton and Cincinnati that they do have panels of attorneys who've agreed to mediate cases there, but rather than assign them periodically like we do in settlement week, um, they will simply, uh, if they get a case that that's what the parties want to do, um, I'm not sure whether the, the judge calls the mediator or whether you give the list to the parties and they pick somebody, but there's some process by which then an attorney mediator is identified. And then the case is sent to that attorney for mediation. And there's a set of procedures about that that look very much like the settlement week set of procedures in terms of uh, noticing the conference and what you have to do in terms of exchanging demands and offers ahead of time and restricting the mediator's report back to the court to it's either settled or it's not. We don't want any information about what happened, that sort of stuff. Um, but that's in our procedures manual, but I think that, as I said, that's pretty much a Dayton Cincinnati kind of thing. Um, the third process in there, and I'll mention it just because it's in there, but I haven't seen one of these in years, is summary jury trial. And again, some of you may remember that was kind of a hot thing probably back in the late 80s, early 90s, especially when Judge Lambros, who had, was a big proponent of that, uh, was still on the bench, um, and I actually did one of them, and it did get a case set. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's gotten married in the right case. Uh, so we have that as one of the options, but it does require consent of the parties, um, and I can't remember the last time anybody in Columbus has asked for a summary jury trial, but if anybody wants one, we've got a written procedure for it, and it's available. Uh, the last one is, is judicial mediation, and again, this is something that we've all done uh, without a specific set of procedures for a long, long time, um, any district judge or magistrate judge can and will mediate a case. Um, and uh, as mentioned in the introduction, um, I, I said I've probably mediated over 100 cases. My guess is it's, it's maybe several times that number. Um, and it's been a lot more recently. Until two years ago, we had a court staff mediator. And again, some of you remember him, Bob Kaiser. Um, who I thought did a great job, and the feedback from everybody was, was pretty positive. Uh, his <coughs> position was eliminated for funding reasons, uh, which I think is really unfortunate. He's gone back into private practice, and I still have attorneys uh, today um, say, well, the last case we had here, Bob Kaiser mediated the case. Can we use him again? And my response is, if you'd like to hire him, yes, you can <laughs> use him again. Um, and some people go do that. Uh, so he's out there, he's available, he's just not with the court anymore, so we don't have that. Um, and, and since he's left, um, a lot of the more complex cases, cases that are going to require a half a day or a day of mediation, uh, have ended up with the magistrate judges as mediators. Um, and, and we've developed a little wrinkle on, on this, and I'm not sure exactly why it is, but uh, I, I'm starting to get used to the new practice. Uh, and that is, if you read our procedure, it actually says specifically that judicial mediation is going to be done by either a district judge or magistrate judge who is not an assigned judge in the case. Um, so the way that works for us is typically I get a request for mediation in one of my cases, I just send a note out to Judge King, Judge uh, Devers, and Judge Abel and say, which one of you would like to do a mediation for me? And the first one that responds gets the case. Um, and I get those emails from them. So we trade our cases around now in Columbus. Um, and I think probably within, well, I, I know within the last, uh, last 12 month period I've done probably on average one or two a month uh, as a result of that process. Um, and uh, again, that's an option that, that I think some parties think uh, there's something about having a judge <coughs> as a mediator that is helpful in terms of the party's perception of the process and maybe even influencing the parties in terms of, of trying to get to yes. Um, the, the, the pro that's, that's not a, a perfect process either. 
uh, at least my style uh, of mediation is to be very much facilitative and very little evaluative. And I think most judges find themselves in that situation because we are called to evaluate cases all the time, but we do it in a very formal context. That is, we either have a hearing or we get briefs and we do research, and, and there's a lot that goes into making a judicial judgment call as to the merits of the case. In a mediation, we don't have the benefit of any of that, and, and I don't like to offer people an opinion uh, about the merits or value of their case um, if I haven't done the same kind of in-depth analysis that I would do if I were rendering a judicial opinion. So most of what I do as a mediator is really just facilitative. Um, and, and with volunteer mediators, I think sometimes you can go beyond that because you don't have to worry about the fact that somebody is going to think, well, there's a judge who just gave a, a any metaphor you'd like in terms of using the back side of your, your body, um, seat of the pants or, or something like that opinion that really turned out not to be very good. But at the same time, I'm also very conscious of the fact that as a judge, if I express an opinion, um, people tend to latch onto that as having some peculiar validity. No matter how much I disclaim at the beginning, um, you know, I'm the person sitting in this room who knows the least about this case. Um, so my opinion is worth just that. If I give an opinion, somebody latches onto it. And, and a lot of times, um, the party who latches onto it then is the one who actually needs to be moving during the process to get the case settled, and they won't because they're stuck on some comment that the judge made. Um, so I, I try as hard as I can to avoid all that. So if, if you want that more sort of evaluative approach to mediation, uh, my thought would be that you're better off with a, a private mediator or a volunteer attorney mediator than you are with a judge, uh, because with a lot of judges you don't get it. Now a lot of you have had experience with some of the, our, our judges in particular, um, and you know that some of them can be quite evaluative in the process. Um, so if that's what you're looking for too, but, but you, I, I think you make sort of a, uh, just a reasoned determination about what you, what you think your case needs um, and then decide which one of those ways you want to go. So that's our menu for the Southern District is those four options, which is settlement week, attorney mediation, judicial officer mediation, and, and summary jury trial. Are, are not Judge Marbley and Judge Sargis still doing their own mediations? You know, they do. Um, you won't find that in our policies <laughs> manual, uh, but uh, everything on our policies manual, I hope, uh, starts with a phrase, unless otherwise ordered. Uh, we tried to put that in almost every meaningful paragraph in there. And actually, I, I've, within the last 30 days, I've done at least one and maybe two mediations in cases that I'm the assigned judicial officer, so we all do that. Uh, but the preference uh, coming out of our administrative area is, is that we swap them around. But I agree with you, too. I mean, sometimes there's a real benefit to having the mediator be an assigned judge in the case because of the judge's familiarity with the case or, or things of that nature. There's also a risk, I think, in using the trial judge, though, and that, that, that is another one. It, I mean, from the practitioner standpoint, it cuts both ways. Yeah. Because you're anxious because in a mediation, most of the time you hear stuff that may not be or is not going to be admissible, you know, at the trial. And it's particularly true if it's a jury waived case. <coughs> Uh, where the judge is also going to, you know, be the decider of fact. And yeah, I, I will never mediate a case where I'm I'm the finder of fact. I, I just I, I refuse to do that, and I don't like to do it even in a jury trial context. But I don't mind doing it in a case where I'm simply <coughs> doing the typical magistrate judge duties. Yeah. Have you compared success rates between Only personally and only anecdotally. Uh, but I, I will tell you that I, I think my success rate on the ones that I do, it probably runs around 50%, which is very comparable to the settlement week process. Um, and and it, uh, I guess I would attribute that to a couple of factors. One is um, I, I, I probably fall in the average range in terms of mediators, so I ought to be doing it at least as well as the average mediator. Um, one of the reasons why maybe we don't get quite as many settlements is we do tend to get the really thorny cases. Um, I just had one a week or two ago, which I never would have sent to settlement week. And when I got the parties in there, um, it, it turned out that the issue that was dividing them uh, was that one party had gotten an adverse ruling during in the district court um, and really just wanted to appeal it. 
um, and they couldn't figure out a way to settle what was left in the district court without going to trial and still preserve the issue for appeal. Now, so that's a case that's not going to settle. I mean, there's just no way to break that kind of an impasse. Um, so sometimes we get things like that, and, and, and that has an impact on our rate. But I, I would say that overall, we do about 50%. That would be my guess. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.